Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethel. It is good to see you. Please stand as we get started with our service with Blessed Be the Name. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Majesty, worship His Majesty. On 
seated. It is good to see you here this morning. Um, we are very glad that you are here worshiping with us. A couple announcements. First off, um, a couple uh, weeks ago before I went to camp, we had uh, Cody came and announced his Eagle Project. Uh, so if next week will be kind of the last week we're going to wrap up uh, taking those donations, we've got a good um, group of donations so far, so we've got a good uh, start on that, but if you do have some that you forgot about, uh, you can bring those next week. I know he's got two or three that he is going to pick up from cars today, so, so that is good as well. So, uh, and if you have any questions, just let us know. Also, uh, regarding um, the current COVID situation, um, we want to go ahead and make the announcement. We're going to stay very um, in tune with Jackson County. Um, I know that Independence has not weighed, the Independence Health Department has not weighed in yet, um, but we're going to stay um, kind of in connection with Jackson County. So what we're asking people to do is please come um, wearing masks and when you are um, moving about. Um, so when you have, when you're coming in, going out, um, you know, welcome, exit, those type of thing, please, um, our, our preference would be that you wear a mask. And this is whether you are vaccinated or unvaccinated. Once you are in your seat and you are uh, social distanced, then if it is easier for you to take the mask off or kind of on and off, that is perfectly fine, uh, things like that. Now, I, I know you guys are probably watching the news. That changes about every 15 minutes on what the guidance is. So that's where we're at at this point. Um, if that changes, um, we will let you know. Uh, knock on wood, I am thankfully not hearing a lot of things about shutdowns and us needing to go back virtual and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully that will continue to stay the case. All right, if you have any questions, please let either me or Wendell or Ray or any of the, the, the leaders know and we will be happy to talk through your concerns with that. With that, let's stand and continue to worship with Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, He is holy and just, by His power we trust.
Good morning. How is everyone today? It's good to be back. Thank you for, thank you for, I got you. Good morning. Good morning. Did you pay attention to the words of the songs today? Did you hear them with your ear? Or did you hear them with your heart? What did we sing about today? The majesty of the Lord. The greatness of our God. The blessedness of being a part of his kingdom. We should sing them again. We might here in a minute. We just never know. Did you hear the words of the songs this morning? Worship his what? Majesty. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me pray with you this morning as we continue to worship and think about the greatness of our God and his majesty in our lives. Father, as we come to this time in our service when we will open your word and see what you have to say to us. Father, I pray that we don't just see what you have to say to us, but we hear what you have to say to us today. God, that we don't just sing the words of the songs, but God, we worship the message of the song. You are the message today. You are the one who deserves and is worthy of our praise today. All that we do as we gather together as a family is to be geared around and to be, to be centered around the truth of your word, the truths you give to us, and the promises that you fulfill every single day in our lives. So God, I pray that as we worship this morning, as we continue, as we open your word and we, 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 we talk about and we, we have a deeper understanding of your thoughts about the law, that we remember who you are and that we remember because of who you are, if we've entered into a relationship with you, who we are as a result of that. God, be heavy upon us today and, and, and show us through your word how we can magnify you better, how we can worship your majesty. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. Well, I would invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, as we will continue to work through uh, this, this great gospel as we're, we're in uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount still, and we'll be in the Sermon on the Mount for a while. You knew that. Uh, you just know that. But Matthew chapter 5, as we, we begin really, uh, uh, Brett Fredenberg began really to turn the corner last week from, from the this is who we are to this is because of who we are, this is how we are to live. And the rest of the Sermon on the Mount and then really the rest of the book of Matthew is a story uh, played out of, of how is it that we are to live 
based on how we are to look. The Beatitudes showed us how we are to look, what we are to put on display in our lives, the kinds of characteristics that are to be on display in every believer's life and evident for the world to see. If you're poor in spirit, if you mourn over your sin, if you are humble and meek and seeking mercy and giving mercy. Those are the things that Christ says we are to look like. And now he begins, starting really in verse number 13, and then following, this is how, because of what we look like, this is how we live. He will continue that today and then as we get deeper into this. Matthew chapter 5, hope you are there. Stand with me as we read, beginning in verse number 17. Jesus says this, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does, does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, I pray you would bless the reading of your word this morning and that you would open our eyes and you would open our ears, but most of all, you would open our hearts to your message for us today. The message of obedience, and how we should begin to live in this world. Thank you for Jesus and his example. You may be seated. Well, where are we in this Sermon on the Mount? And what does this time and, what, and, and, and the, this particular passage of Scripture and, and what... As, as Jesus is going to continue to walk and talk for three years on the earth, what is it that he will kind of model for us? Well, if you lived in Jesus' time and you weren't a follower of Jesus, or even if you were a follower of Jesus, all right, one of the things that you would probably notice about Jesus, it, it, it would probably... Some of the rumors about Jesus, and you know that there were rumors about Jesus, right? But I'm, I could be fairly confident in my own mind to, to say that, that those people who watched Jesus and listened to Jesus and then formed an opinion about Jesus, they probably said something like this. Jesus has very little use for the law. How do I come to that conclusion? What are the things that he discusses about the law and what are the things that he does as he's walking through life, not necessarily yet in the Sermon on the Mount, but you know many of the stories and many of the conflicts that Jesus had with the scribes and the Pharisees as it related to what? The law, right? Jesus Followers and those who were watching him from a distance, they probably were, their conversations around the dinner table were, he just doesn't have much use for the law. They're oppressive. The law is burdensome. The, the law is, Jesus is saying, the law is not really worthy to be obeyed. That was the conversation around the dinner table. Based on what? 
based on Jesus' words and Jesus' actions. And so they're probably reasonable, quote-unquote, reasonable thoughts, because that's just what they observed. But I'm going to tell you, and Jesus is going to say in this, this, these verses we just read, they were wrong thoughts. Jesus is not saying, I have no use for the law. Jesus is not saying, you have, as followers of mine, no use for the law. The law has its reasons. The law has its, there, there was, there, there, there was a, a purpose for the law. And so I'm not saying the law is not to be listened to, heard, understood, and obeyed. He says very clearly, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. He's crystal clear on that. He said, I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to bring it to its highest point. He said, I... Even though you can't, he said, I have come to show you that it can be 100% obeyed to the highest level imaginable, Jesus is saying. I'm not coming to destroy it. I'm coming to fulfill it. And in my demonstration to show you as a human being that it is possible to follow the law if you have the right help. That's That's essentially what he is saying. But much of the misunderstanding, I believe, that of Jesus' contempt for the law, it's centered around what did they hear when they heard the words, the law, or the law and the prophets. You see, in that time, there were four primary understandings or interpretations of the law or the law and the prophets, okay? That's what Jesus is talking about. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the law and the prophets. So when Jesus said that, what did did you hear? And what is your interpretation of those words? It was one of four, okay? Either it was the Ten Commandments, all right, and the Ten Commandments, of course, for us are found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, or they understood that to be the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch or the Torah, or the entirety of Scripture to that point, which was the Old Testament, or the oral or the scribal law. What is the oral or the scribal law? The oral or the scribal law is that which they talked about or over the kitchen table because it was that which was given to them. The oral or the scribal law was the interpretation of the Ten Commandments, the first five books of the Bible, and the entirety of the Old Testament by human beings. That was the oral or the scribal law. Who did that? The scribes did that. The scribes interpreted the Ten Commandments, and they said, this is what they mean. And then they passed it on, and they passed it on, and they passed it on. Let me give you a, a kind of a today example of what this, how this misconception can also, um, or, or, or this 
understanding, personal understanding, can lead to a misconception as to what I mean. Okay? If I say the word partner, what does that mean to you? Partner. Your, your partner. What does that mean? Well, right off the top of my head, I can think of three, right? The person that I'm in business with, right? <clears throat> Your significant other of the opposite sex, or your significant other of the same sex. Whether we agree with that or whether we don't, that's, there is an interpretation out there that says that. So if I say, if, I, if, if you, know, you and your partner, your understanding of that or your default understanding of that, interpretation of that, will determine what you think I'm saying to you. That's what's happening here. Their default understanding, okay, because the default understanding of the day of these four things was the fourth one, the oral law or the scribal law. When, when, when Jesus was talking, when, when the Pharisees were talking about the law, they were talking about that which they enforced, the Pharisees. The scribes wrote it, the Pharisees enforced it. And it was very much every day, all day, in your face. And so because it was every day, all day, in your face, that was the most common default understanding of do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. Not the Ten Commandments, not the first five books of the Bible, not the Old Testament, but the oral law, the scribal law that the, the scribes interpreted and the Pharisees enforced it. So everyone would, un, would, would, would think differently, really, or have the opportunity to think differently, but most people thought about that piece of it, okay? So the scribal law, here's where we are, the scribal law, and here's the, the other side of the coin, all right? Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, the first three. Okay, the scribal law or the oral law, Jesus did come to destroy that. Okay, he did come to destroy that. That was the exhausting man-made rules and regulations to live by of everyday life. The scribes took the law, the Ten Commandments, or the first five books of the Bible, and they made them what? burdensome, oppressive, and impossible. The law was originally intended to do something entirely different. See, God never intended the interpretation of the law to take precedence over the law itself. God never intended the interpretation of the law to supersede the law. Because the law, if you read the law, if you read the Ten Commandments, they're very general guidelines for living. If you read the Torah or the Pentateuch, they're, they're, you don't get a lot of detail about how you are supposed to interpret the law individually. What you, what you have in the law are these broad principles that, that God meant for you to take as broad principles, seek his will for your life in those principles, and now go about living your daily life. But they were never to be interpreted without God's guidance in your life. The scribal interpretations, they, they, they were, what they did was they were changeable based on what? 
The exact same thing we find today. Laws change today based on what? The current way of thinking. Irregardless of what the law or the law and the prophets say, man's law changes with current thinking, current culture, current values, if you will. That's just the nature of man. Because from the very beginning, what has man attempted to do? Lower the standard. That's what we do. And because we do, we, lo- we want to lower the standards of God, and which then makes my standard look not quite so bad. So here, here's the gap, and because today the culture says this particular thing is not so bad anymore. 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 What is it that we've always tried to do? Discount God's standards and raise my righteousness. That's what we've always done. God's standards have what? Never changed because God is what? The same when? Yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed the standards. We just interpret them to meet our particular situation and needs. That's what Jesus came to destroy. And as we continue to go through the rest of this Sermon on the Mount, and then as we see Jesus model it for the rest of the book of Matthew, that's the piece of it that we must understand. He didn't come to destroy it, he came to fulfill it. He never intended for the interpretation of the law to supersede the law itself. When we get to Matthew chapter 15, we're going to see this very clearly. Let me just read real quickly one particular example that, we'll, of course, we'll get to when we get to Matthew 15. But this was a situation where the scribes' interpretation of the law invalidated the law itself in their mind, made disregarding God's law the right thing to do. And some of you who are getting up in age, if you've written your will, or if you're, then, then you'll, you'll want to hear this, okay, because this is what Jesus is talking about. Matthew chapter 15. The scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now I would ask you very simply, if it was me, be, if, if you were asking me that, I would just simply say, because I don't want to wash my hands, okay? I'm a guy and I don't do it. If I want to eat after I'm playing in the dirt, let me eat after I played in the dirt. I do it all the time. Ask my wife. Why do you care if I wash my hands before I eat? Well, because the scribes said you must wash your hands to be ceremonially clean before you eat. Jesus' answer was even better than mine would have been. Jesus said, Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. It's about to get serious here in Matthew chapter 15. Verse 6. Then he, 
let me, uh, no, verse 5. But you say, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. In other words, my, my um, inheritance I'm leaving to my family. But all of a sudden, I don't like that child very much anymore. Or my parents did something that I don't like anymore. So I'm going to say all of my inheritance, I'm, I'm going to give it to the church instead. Pretty noble thing, right? Jesus says that transgressing the law of God. Honoring your father and your mother is above giving all of your inheritance to the church. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you don't leave some to the church if you so choose, all right? (laughs) If you so choose, but not because you're mad at your parents or you're mad at your kid, right? Thus, you have made the commandment of God no effect by your tradition. You see, your interpretation of it makes God's law of no effect. That's what Jesus came to destroy. So where are we in this? God's law, what he's saying here is God's law requires, that's what we'll find out throughout the rest of this chapter and throughout the rest of really the Sermon on the Mount, requires two kinds of obedience. What did you hear, and what is in your heart? God's law required both inward obedience and outward obedience. I do, because I love God, I respect God, I have reverence for God. That's our interpretation, to be our interpretation of the law. You see, the scribal interpretation, or man's law, if you will, it only requires outward obedience. And because it only requires outward obedience, it actually should make it easier to follow the scribal law than it is to follow God's law. Because all I have to do is not murder, not commit adultery, not lie, that, and, and, and I'm good, right? The physical act, right? Never mind how I feel about you internally, what's really going on in my head when I look at you. But as long as I don't lie about you, then I'm good, right? Jesus is saying, no, the law has always been about inward and outward obedience. So what is it when Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, what is it but to fulfill it? What exactly did Jesus come to fulfill? He came to fulfill... The essence of the law, that which is behind the words. We sing about the majesty of God. Worship his majesty, right? What is majesty to you? Again, it's that your interpretation of majesty. But he came to fulfill the essence of the law. The essence of the law is only twofold. What is it that when Jesus was asked, what's the, the, what's the greatest commandment? What do we boil it down to? What is the greatest commandment? We boil it down to two things. Love God. Love people. Exactly. That's what Jesus is saying here. The essence of the law is, first of all, a reverence for God, a respect for God, an awe of God. And we see that in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 11. Those are the laws, those are the commandments that have to do with my vertical, if you will. That's the thing we always talk about in church, this vertical relationship between me and God, between God and man. 
And the second component of that is respect for man. Exodus 20, verses 12 through 17, which is the do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not lie, do not covet your neighbor, your neighbor's wife, your, his donkey, or all those things. How I relate to my neighbor. It's the same thing. It's always been about that. Only two things. Love God, love people. How do I demonstrate it? Jesus came to fulfill the essence of the law. When he said in Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. For six days you'll do all your work and on the seventh is set apart for the Lord. Well, the scribes then, they they had to decide what's work. And you wouldn't believe all of the things that they then wrote. Volumes upon volumes upon volumes just about work on the Sabbath. Volumes. Because if we're going to interpret this so that you can understand it, right? If we're going to interpret it so that I can understand it, i got to be very clear because Wendell's not very smart. Okay? So I'm going to say work is, the definition of work is you can't carry a burden. Well, wait a minute. Now Wendell's going to ask because Wendell's not very smart. He's going to say, well, what's a burden? Now I've got to define burden. And did you know that what just happened with, with, with a, a mother picking up her child and walking out of the sanctuary, because, which I, I'm, I'm not drawing attention to that, I'm saying, but, but when that just happened, the Pharisee or the scribe at the podium would have looked and said, you need to get saved. You just worked on the Sabbath. Because they picked up their child, and that was heavier than the burden you were allowed to carry. If that child cut their finger this afternoon, playing in the dirt, all right, after they ate when they didn't wash before that, okay? If that child cut their finger... You could do this, but not this. You could put a Band-Aid on it, but you couldn't wash it out and put any Neosporin on that cut. Because the, putting the Band-Aid on it just made it okay for right now, but if you washed it out and you put Neosporin on it, then that was doing something extra, and that was considered work. If you sewed for a living... Sandy, all right, if you sewed for a living and, and you made, you were a tailor and, and that was your job Monday through Saturday and you put a needle in the lapel of your outer cloak and then you forgot that it was there and you walked to the synagogue Sunday morning with that in your lapel, you would have been looked at by the scribes and said, did you bring an extra sacrifice today? Because you just carried an extra burden. I'm telling you, none of that is the essence of the law. But that's what we do to people when we put burdens on them as it relates to things that are not scriptural, not part of the law. When we say to them, you must do this or you can't do that based on my interpretation of the law. That's what we do all the time. And don't say you don't because we all have the problem of being judgmental in one way or another, at one time or another, in some sort of situation or another. We just do. 
So Jesus came to fulfill the essence of the law, reverence for God and respect for man. As it relates to life, as it relates to property, as it relates to truth, as it relates to another good man, if I slander you, then I have just taken the essence of the law away. So what does that mean for us? How then should we treat God's word? How, sh- what sh- how should we look at the law? First of all, what we, what we find and what we see is I should... Receive it for what it is. I should receive it for what it is. You see, Jesus' main message in all of this is that performing the letter of the law does not satisfy the demands of the law. When we get to murder, when we get to adultery, when we get to um, truth telling and, and integrity when we get to retaliation all right when we get to retaliation verse 38 through 42 some of you might want to take that week off because his message is performing to the letter of the law does not satisfy the demands of the law And our obedience should not be obedience out of fear. It should be obedience out of love and respect and awe for God. That's what Jesus is saying, his main message. Verse 20, I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. See, their righteousness was based on fear. I can't get caught with a needle in my lapel. I can't get caught keeping my child's cut from getting infected. Just put the Band-Aid on it right over the dirt. And some would say, well, that's what the law says, and so what would that mean? I just got to trust God that my kid's cut won't get infected. And if I do anything other than what the law says, then I'm not trusting enough. I don't have enough faith. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not even what the law is saying, but our interpretation of that when we look at the, the current state of affairs is we can't wear a mask because that means I don't have enough faith. There, I said it. And I'm going to walk out of the camera. That's not what Jesus would say. So we should receive and treat God's word as for what it is. We should honor God's word. He says in verse 19, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, being very visible about being disobedient puts you in great peril as it relates to your relationship current relationship, doesn't, not eternal relationship, current relationship with God. We should honor God's word. We don't take away from it. We don't add to it. We don't diminish it. We don't relax it. God's word is what it says it is. And we are not to take man's word over God's word. We're not to take man's word over God's word. Third, We obey God's law. Ah, There it is again, right? We obey God's word. What does that look like? How do I know what that looks like? He says, so so let's go back to our eating thing here. Jeremiah, the prophet, says this in Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. He says says to God as as he's crying out to God, he says, your words were found, I found your law, 
I found your words, he said, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. He didn't, he, he didn't necessarily physically chew up the paper or the, whatever they used and swallowed it. He ate them through his eyes into his soul. Remember Jesus said, what goes into your mouth is discarded, but what goes into your eyes goes into your heart. Your words were found and I ate them. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing, being discerning about the word of truth, knowing the right application of the word based on my relationship with God because he's the one who's doing the interpreting in my life. The thing that I found more than anything else is you know, you know what's right. How do we know what's right? The Bible tells us that because God in his sovereign, infinite wisdom gave you what? A conscience. And your conscience is what convicts you. That's why those who are so hardened in their conscience, they don't even know what's wrong anymore because they've rejected Christ for so long and in so many ways, they don't even know what's wrong anymore because their heart has been so hardened. Go read the book of Exodus when Moses went to talk to the Pharaoh. Read First and Second Kings. When all of the king after king after king after king after king did what was not right in the eyes of the Lord. You know what's right because God planted in your heart the right. We choose, I choose to ignore and do it anyway. What is that? That is disobedience. Not just to man's laws, but to God's laws as well. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. So we should receive the law for what it is. We should honor God's word. We should obey God's word. We should defend God's word. It means we should, we don't, God's word doesn't need me to be standing here defending it. Right? But we, we, we need to fight for the integrity of the word. That God's word is what it says it is. The purity of God's word and the authority of God's word. I should Defend the authority of God's word. You should, as a believer, defend the authority of God's word. And finally, what we should do with God's word is proclaim the truth of God. Proclaim it. Paul said in Romans chapter 116, I am not what? Ashamed of what? The gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I am not ashamed to talk about the God who saved me. That is what we're going, we're, that is what we're supposed to do. So Christ is not saying, I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came to proclaim it for what it is. The final authority for your life to be honored, obeyed, defended, and proclaimed. But he says all of that, and he finishes this with what? That thing which we absolutely have to have, to, to, or we think we absolutely have to have in order to do the things that we know we're supposed to do, right? 
You know you're supposed to obey. Children, here we go. Are you, are you hearing me here? All right, this is for you. All right, it's really not just for you, but it's really for you right now. We know we're supposed to obey, but then we start to bargain. We say, can I have a cookie if I, do, if I clean up my room? And the promise, all right, we, we want to bargain. So God knows that, and so Jesus said, all right, so here's the deal, all right? I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the, the, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he says, here's your reward. Who wants to go? Let me pray with you. God, you are good to us. You show us how we should live. God, even as we bargain with you about our reward, and Father, please understand, I think you know, Father, I pray that, 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 that these people know that I'm not making light of your promise of a reward in heaven. But God, so many times we do these things thinking that we're bargaining with you, but God, you've already given us all that we need for life and godliness. And so God, I pray that we understand that, that as, we, as we live our life, as we, as we follow the essence of the law and we love you and we love our fellow man and we do all of that because of our respect and our love and our honor for you, that God, people will see that and the characteristics that you've already shown us about what we should look like will be evident and easily identifiable. God, Jesus is very clear. You are very clear how we should live. May we hear your words today and know and understand what it is that you have for us because of our obedience. A home in heaven forever with you and your son, where we can live eternally in praise and glory and honor, worshiping your majesty. Thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Jesus is clearly teaching, clearly pointing in Matthew chapter 5 to one thing. You can't do this by yourself. The only way you can live the blessed life, the only way you can demonstrate all of these things is through a personal relationship with, God, with the Father, through the acceptance by faith in the finished work of Christ. What we call salvation through repentance. What that does is that leads us to receive a new heart. What Jesus, what, what the prophet Ezekiel said, I will take out your heart of stone and I will put in a heart of flesh. The only way we can live this life, the only way we can live the essence of the law is through a relationship with Christ. And I would invite you this morning to accept that gift of salvation if you have not made that commitment to Christ yet. I'd be, I would love to have the opportunity to speak with you about that after our service today. Well, one of the ways that we proclaim that as believers is through the observance of the Lord's Supper. So as we, we, we partake of that this morning, I would invite you even today so use this time as a time to worship the majesty of God as you remember all that he's done for you and all of the promise that you have in store for you because of what Jesus did as he was obedient to the Father.
So how we do this is, is in, in, as we've, we've done before is the cups are here on the table and this is, again is the double cup. The cup with the, the, the top cup is the juice, the bottom cup is the, the bread and so you'll have to take them, them apart as we take the elements. So let me pray and then as you, you, you come and pick up the elements and then return to your seat and then we'll partake of them together uh, as a family. Father, you are good and great and worthy of all praise today. God, all that we live for, I pray, is to glorify you. The chief end of man is to bring glory to the Father. And so I pray that we do that this morning as we partake of this remembrance service, the time that we are called to 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 bring to mind all that you've done for us. But God, it is a finished work. And those who have believed can know with assurance that it is well with my soul because of Jesus. In whose name I pray. You come as you're ready to take the elements this morning.
Matthew 26 says this to us. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Jesus had come to Jerusalem for one purpose. His time had now come for all that God had planned for him to be fulfilled. You see, Jesus didn't come just to fulfill the law. Jesus came to fulfill a promise, the promise of redemption. And this time that they were coming to the, to the feast of the Passover was a time set aside specifically for remembering, remembering all that God had done for his people, the nation of Israel. And as they gathered together for the Passover, everything that was said, everything that was acted out, all of the tastes and the smells and the environment was built around one thing. Remember all God has done for you. We do that here with this song over and over as we remember there's something about that name, the name of Jesus. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And they went out from that place after they had sung a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. They went out to live the rest of their days after they'd sung a hymn as they remembered all that Jesus did for them. Stand and let's be dismissed as we sing this song of remembrance and then we go out to live. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Bless us as we give glory to your name today. In Jesus' name. We are one.